We want to welcome you out to uh, our uh, church service today, and we want to welcome our VCC church family and anyone else who may be watching. We want to wish you a happy Easter, happy Resurrection Sunday, and so it's so good to be gathered together in His name, and uh, we're going to celebrate today and uh, get started, and we're so glad that you tuned in, and uh, we have a few announcements we just want to uh, begin with. I want to say this is a special time. Uh, we're never going to forget this Easter Sunday. I, there's never been a time when uh, we've done this before. But you know what? We're going we're gonna to look to Jesus, and He's going to help us, and we're going to celebrate. And so uh, it's good to be together with you. Um, we, wanna ha we have some prayer requests we want to just uh, mention uh, today that some of you have uh, gotten to me. And we know that prayer works, and so I want to encourage you. Uh, to get those to me, we can uh, lift those up and pray together, and we know there's power in corporate prayer. First of all, Monique, uh, she asked us, uh, she uh, Evergreen Hospital, we want to pray for a program, uh, um, a job for nursing students, and so she can get into that, and uh, so she gets the experience she needs, because she needs hands-on credit for that, uh, and we want to pray that she uh, that door is open for her. We know that as God's people, we have favor uh, because we can pray and God can help us and God can move and open doors. We also want to pray that she gets approved for financial, uh, the financial aid, the financial part of it for the fall. And so we're believing God. We're lifting that up before our faithful God. I also want to pray for uh, April sister Brenda. Some of you uh, have been known. Uh, been praying for her. Just want to pray that God would help her in her situation. And uh, praise God, we know that prayer definitely helps people. And so if we could lift that up today. We also just want to pray for our president during this uh, trying time and this uh, time that he's facing, pray, praying God's wisdom and guidance upon him. I want to lift up our nation, praying for healing, both physically, uh, praying for those sick, praying God would just uh, heal them and help them. We also want to pray for healing spiritually. And uh, just believing God to move in the land. Also, I want to pray and to believe God for this virus to be gone. Just take dominion and authority. I want to lift up our headship, praying for Pastor Mitchell. Uh, health, uh, protection, many years upon this earth. I want to lift up uh, Pastor Greg Mitchell and his wife, Lisa. We want to pray for Pastor Foley and Janet. We want to pray for Pastor Overson and Connie, just God's hand upon our leaders, our headship, uh, lifting their hands uh, as they uh, cover us and help us and guide us. And so we know that prayer is something that can greatly help them. We want to lift them up. I want to pray for our church family, protection and health, and plead the blood over every person in our congregation, every child, uh, God's protection from this virus. And so we want to pray for that. I want to pray for everyone tuning into these. We have many outside of our church watching these, just praying that God would touch their hearts, their lives, because we know the Word of God doesn't come back void, Isaiah 55. And so I also want to pray for God's anointing over this message that I have for us today, this Easter Sunday. God would just speak that to our hearts and our lives. And I want to encourage you once again, once again to get your prayer requests to me. And so we will definitely lift those up as a congregation, even though we're scattered in our different homes. You know what? We come together and uh, we agree on prayer requests and powerful things happen. Amen. So let's pray right now in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come before you by the blood of Jesus Christ, God. We thank you that you hear us, Lord. And we're reminded this Easter Sunday that you did die, but you also rose again, sealing the deal. And we lift these requests into your into your hands, Lord. We pray that you'd move. We pray for Monique, God, that you'd open the doors for this uh, nursing program, the hands-on, God. We pray that you would move for her, Lord, the financial part of it in the fall. We pray favor upon that, God. I pray for April sister Brenda, God, that you would help her, Lord, and deliver her, God, and cause her to look to you, Lord, and to uh, move in that situation. God, I pray for our president, God, your hand upon his life, God, your wisdom in his life. I pray for our nation, God, healing in the land, God, both spiritually and Physically, God, I pray for our headship, Lord. We're lifting them before you, God, strengthening them. Hallelujah. Covering them, Lord. Lifting the burden that they may have upon them, God, I pray right now. I pray for our church family, God. I plead the blood over them, God. 
Protect them, God, and keep them from this virus, Lord, in Jesus' name. God, and I also uh, just pray, God, your anointing upon this message today, God. We thank you, God. We believe you, Lord, that you're moving, even as we're meeting a different way, God. We believe in what your word says. There's power in what we are doing. We thank you. We turn this time over to you, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Hallelujah. We want to take our offering uh, today, and so as I've been saying, you know, even though we're not able to meet uh, in our traditional building, we still have needs and obligations, and uh, amen, uh, we want to do that, and I want to encourage you, you know, uh, make your tithe, you know, a priority. Uh, you know, the Bible says that, you know, Jesus put us first uh, on the cross and in the resurrection. He's the, the first fruits of the resurrection, and so... Uh, putting God first, taking the time, and maybe you're not able to uh, do cash, but you know what, taking the time, taking the, the effort to go and, and take care of that and drop that off at the church or mail that to the mailing address that I can get to you. And so uh, I was thinking about this. You know, today is Easter, and everything we have as Christians hinges upon the fact of that. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 says, If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. We know that he, he did rise from the dead. And we know because of that, everything we have is because of what we have in him. Because he says who he was, he was God in the flesh, and we know that him paying the price on the cross and rising again the third day, all that we have as Christians is because of what he did. Amen. And we thank God for that. And so I want to encourage you, uh, get, your, get your tithe in. Amen. And so... Uh, that's a that's something God wants us to do, and so I want to encourage you that not when you get around to it, but you know what, making that a priority in your life. And so, uh, Amen. Let's let's do that. Amen. Believe God with that. Hallelujah. We wanna we wanna uh, take uh, or just observe Easter by uh, taking communion uh, together, and you know this is we're not able to do it together in a building, but you know what, we're not gonna let that stop us. But we wanna celebrate Easter by taking. Uh, communion, and uh, I just want to uh, encourage you, hold off till we can partake together. And so we, we believe in the open table uh, uh, in communion, and we want, want you to join us uh, doing that, because we, we do this symbolically. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And so we know the Passover, different things, they were celebrating that before, as he was in Jerusalem, before they went to the cross, and uh, different things associated with that. And so, uh, you know, we want to do that today. You know, there's a lot of emphasis on the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We understand that. Friday was Good Friday. But once he shed his blood and paid the price, he was off the cross. And the Bible puts just as much emphasis on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ because Sunday, today, he rose from the grave. He rose from the tomb. Rising from the dead means God was satisfied with his payment. 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26, the Apostle Paul writes, and he says, For I received from the Lord, Jesus, the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I just want to give you give you some time to do that together. Get your getting your children. If you're having them do this with you, I think it's a good thing to do. And so we're gonna uh, partake together. We're gonna take the bread, remembering that His body was broken for us. He goes on to say, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We do it symbolically, and we remember the blood that was shed on the cross for you and I. Let's take that together.
And he goes on to say, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And thank God this morning that he paid the price for our sin on the cross. But we also thank God for the resurrection. that The Bible says sealed the deal for you and I and completed the transaction with the Father. Amen. Thank God for that. So we want to get into the Word this morning because that's what this is all about. This morning coming to church and uh, hearing a word from God. And so we want to, uh, I want you to do that with me. We're going to go to uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Get set up here, chapter 24. We're going to read a couple verses of Scripture here, reading verses 1 through 12. And as you're turning there, and just kind of some, some thoughts that I had during this time uh, that we're facing around us and thinking about some things. You know, and I was thinking to myself, most of the time, empty isn't a good thing. You know what? If you're driving in your car and you find out that you have an empty tank and, and or near empty, or maybe you can relate to that. How many have ever ran out of gas before. I know I have, and so that's probably why they put those lights in the new cars that uh, tell you when you're close to uh, having an empty tank because uh, many people have uh, ran out of gas before. Sometimes, you know, uh, that's something we can face. That's why we got to fill up. Or even an empty stomach never feels good, whether it's been a long time you're at work and it's been a long time since breakfast. You don't have time for lunch or, you know, sometimes we, we fast as Christians and that's not always uh, a fun time for our physical body. And so that's something we can, we can relate to. Or even an empty account, an empty bank account. Or a near to empty bank account isn't good. Have you ever been broke before? I know I have. Or a life emptied of faith is never good. It seems like it's really hard to believe God in your life. And so we've probably all been there before. We know that uh, this morning, uh, you know, an empty church building is not good. But you know what? We're meeting together as God's church right now uh, via YouTube. But most of the time, emptiness is not something that's good in our life. But I want to look at some things that are good, really good, the Bible says, when they're empty. And so I want to preach this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, a sermon I have entitled, When Empty is Good. And so I want you to follow along with me this morning. Amen. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Talk about, uh, you guessed it, the Easter story, beginning in verse number 1. Read with me this morning the Word of God. The Bible says these words, and on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and other and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven, to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. Verse 11. And their words seemed to seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Verse number 12, But Peter arose and ran to the tomb. That's why we love Peter, because he always acts first, thinks second. And stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Amen. Let's think about this today. When empty is good. First of all, I want you to think with me about the empty cross. The reason why empty is usually not a good thing is because empty means containing nothing, not being filled or occupied. 
The room was empty of furniture. Our coffee cup is empty, which is never a good thing in the Northwest. It would seem that some can be facing some emptiness right now in the country in which we live, where some are facing, or it seems like we're all facing an empty economy right now. Some might be facing empty jobs. We have empty church buildings across the land because of this virus. And as I said, most of the time, empty is not a good thing, but we begin this scripture with the empty cross. The Bible says in our text, it was the first day of the week, a Sunday like today. It says that very early, chances are good that the sun hadn't even come up yet. A few of Jesus' followers, women, are on their way to the tomb where Jesus had been buried. He'd been crucified on Friday on, on the cross for about six hours, taken down before sunset, at which time the Sabbath began. And early Sunday morning, a small group of women set out for the tomb. Their task is a sober one. They're going to anoint Jesus' dead body. And as they pass through the north wall of the city of Jerusalem, very possibly, they stopped, motionless, quiet, thinking about what had taken place only two days ago. Maybe the sun barely peeking over the jagged horizon. They look towards the east where Calvary sits only a short distance away. And maybe there on that hill just outside the city stands a gruesome reminder of the events that took place two days prior. Silhouetted against the dawn sky are three crosses. Would the crosses have been left up this long? Very possibly, because we know that Roman execution was done in public places for a reason. Its purpose wasn't only death, but humiliation as well. Jewish historian Josephus writes that in Roman-style crucifixions, the dead bodies were left up for the vultures and other birds to disfigure and consume to send a message that this is what happens when you stand against Rome. Most probably, the crosses are still there, empty of their victims. And I'm sure at the time, a grim reminder to these ladies that their precious teacher and Lord had been killed. But as we think about it this morning, it's because the cross is empty that we have the promise of the forgiveness of sins. Things ha that have been done in our past, possibly things done to us in our past. And many times these th types of things carry with their memory guilt. When, when a human being does wrong, guilt and shame are left. Guilt is a feeling of having done wrong or failed in an obligation. I was reading about, there was a, a letter written, the handwriting was shaky, the note was dated February 6, 1974 and was addressed to the U.S. government. It read, I am sending $10 for the blankets I stole while in the service during World War II. My mind could not rest. Signed, an ex-GI. The GI is not alone in his guilt. His letter is literally part of tons of letters the government has received since it been, began collecting since 1811, part of what is known as the Conscience Fund. True story. An average of $45,000 is collected every year. The biggest year was 1950, where $350,000 came in. One man, writing from Brazil, sent in $50 to cover the cost of two pair of cavalry boots, two pair of trousers, one case of KC rations, uh, 30 frozen meats he stole from the army between 1943-1946. One Colorado woman sent in... 28 cent stamps for having used stamps twice when it wasn't canceled. An IRS agent mailed in $4 for four ballpoint pens. She never returned to the office. And maybe that's not a big deal, but you know what? When we do something wrong, we have anxiety over past mistakes. What do we do with our failures? The Bible says in Colossians 1, 19 through 20, that for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, 
and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. See, this is something that the, the cross does for you and I. It takes care of past mistakes that sometimes haunt us. Sometimes we're reminded of those things by life. Sometimes there's an enemy, the Bible says, that we face. He reminds us. He lies to our minds. But it's because of the empty cross that we know we have the forgiveness of sins. Back to our story, our text. It's also the day after the Sabbath, so none of the Jews would have removed the crosses yet either. So there they stand, an empty reminder of the horrors of Friday. The scene would grow more horrific the closer you'd get. You couldn't see it from a distance, but the closer you got, you see the stains on the cross. Blood stains from the crown of thorns, each end of the crossbar, and where his feet had been nailed, there was blood. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So, this is something. Something had been done upon the cross. And I want to say, when Jesus was taken off the cross, the Bible says he was dead. Don't believe anyone that tells you he was just faking it or that he swooned or passed out. Jesus was dead and everybody knew it. I love the answer given to the lady who wrote into a question and answer form and asked, Dear sir, my, fr my friend said that at Easter, Jesus just fainted on the cross and that his disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? Sincerely, bewildered. The answer was sent, Dear bewildered, beat your friend with a cat of nine tails, with 39 heavy strokes, nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his side, put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours, and see what happens. When they took Jesus off the cross, he was dead. And that's exactly what we need to see. And the cross is empty because of the fact that Jesus did die, and it was that death that was the payment for our sins. A big Bible word, word called substitutionary atonement for all that we would ever, all that we have ever done wrong or not done right. This is what the Bible calls sin. That sin separated us from a holy God, and the Bible says that He took our place on the cross and paid the price we owed to a holy God. And so the cross being empty is full of hope, hope because it shows us that we can be forgiven. The books were balanced. The penalty was paid. The way to the Father had been provided. This is what the cr empty cross means to us. Colossians says it like this, 2, 13 through 50. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, tri triumphant over them in it, the empty cross. Secondly, something else that is good when it's empty is the empty tomb. You know, most of us have visited a gravesite before. We've been there. Sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's a dad or a grandparent or a sibling. Not usually a fun moment. Most of the time, a somber moment when we remember them, we think about them, we honor them. And that site is where they're buried. Some have visited grave sites that have become tourist sites around the world. The pyramids containing the pharaohs, or the Taj Mahal, the largest tomb in India ever built on earth, built by an Indian king in honor of his undying love to his favorite wife. They say that it took 20,000 men 22 years to build. And when they were done, 
I thought I read somewhere that he cut off their hands because he wanted that tomb to be the last structure that they ever built. The Bible says in our text, Luke 24, 1, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices that they had prepared. This was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the tomb in which Jesus' dead body was laid and where it remained for three days. And Luke 24, 2-4 says, But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. You know, not many people can claim to have borrowed a grave, but I want to say Jesus did, and Jesus can. No one has made a more profound impact on our world than he did. The stamp of authority to his entire ministry, the thing that seals the deal, is that after three days in a tomb, he rose from the grave. So why is the tomb so important? That's a good question. This tomb is important simply because it's empty. His body was not found there. It was used for three days by a humble carpenter who had been killed for making extravagant claims. He had the audacity to claim that he was actually God in the flesh. And so the empty tomb is an unshakable testimony that Jesus of Nazareth is who he said he was, the very Son of God and Savior of all who believe. At the time, the religious authorities thought they were silencing Jesus. They patted themselves on the back. The devil rejoiced, but three days later, the tomb was empty. And they helped open the door for the most powerful miracle the world would ever see. 1 Corinthians 2, 7-8 through 8 says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Back to the ladies in our story. After pausing briefly to look at the cross, they continue on their way down the path to the tomb. And as they go, I can imagine them wondering, thinking to themselves, how in the world are we going to move the stone? They had a good reason to be concerned. The stone that was placed in front of the tomb was big, really big. It was typically, they say, set in a groove so it could be slid or rolled, but it's still speculated to have weighed somewhat, somewhere around two tons. It had to be large enough to cover the entire entrance, and it also had to be heavy enough to create enough vertical pressure to actually seal the tomb. And not only that, the Roman soldiers had put Rome's seal upon it that basically stated, no one may enter this tomb punishable by death. As they get close to the tomb and approach the tomb, and they find out that the stone had been rolled away. And there's two angels there. Only they didn't know they were angels. It just says there were two men in shining garments. And Luke 24, 5, speaking to them, Speaking to the ladies, the angel says, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. And so as we think about this, imagine how they must have felt. The tomb was empty. Jesus had risen. He was alive. In spite of all their faith, in spite of their hope, in spite of all that Jesus had told them, they had actually gone to the tomb that day looking for Jesus to be there, dead. But when these ladies went to the tomb, lo and behold, the one they sought was alive. The reason why the empty cross and the empty tomb are so powerful, because if Jesus would have died and stayed dead, then he doesn't have power over life. Therefore, he doesn't have the power to save us, and he doesn't have the power to forgive us of our sins. I heard somebody describe it like this. It's kind of like when you go to Costco. You buy some stuff, and so even now you're keeping your social distance away. You you wish some people would do that. They don't always do that. But you're doing your best from everyone. You get to the door to check out, leave the building. But somewhere, somehow, you lost your receipt. You look around. You check your pockets twice. You ask your wife, do you have the receipt? But whatever you do, you can't find your receipt. 
So they take you back to the register that you paid at to verify that you really did pay. They fair verify that you did pay. Sometimes they even print you out a new receipt, and your receipt verifies that the things in your basket have been paid for. The empty cross and the empty tomb, the resurrection, is your receipt that your sin has been paid for, accepted by the Father. Once he paid the price, he rose from the dead. And this receipt we use whenever we have a lie in our mind, we think back to something that happened in the past that we did wrong. We look to the cross. We look to the resurrection. Even sometimes a lie from the evil one that comes into our mind. Remember this, remember that. Our receipt, we pull it out and we say, you know what, that's been paid for. But our story doesn't end there. There's one more empty thing that is really, really good news to you and I. The empty grave clothes. Back to our story. After the angel had spoken to the women, they immediately go back. They tell the disciples what had happened. With this incredible news, Peter and John immediately head and run for the tomb to see for themselves. When they get there, John stops just outside the tomb. But Peter, because he's Peter, runs right in. And sure enough, the tomb was empty. But that's not all. Inside, Peter finds the grave clothes that Jesus had been buried in. And guess what? They're empty too. Verse 12 of Luke 24, the message translation says it like this. But Peter jumped to his feet, ran to the tomb. He stooped to look in and saw a few grave clothes. How were they arranged? We don't really know. But why are the empty grave clothes so powerful to you and me? Because the Bible says, we shall be like him. And some Christians say, I, I know, you know what, one day, you know, uh, I'm going to be like him. But he, he's not just talking about someday, not just living in heaven one day, but living for him right here and now, you and I can be like him. The old Adamic man, the old ways, the old life, forsaking the past, we look to the future. Colossians 3, 10 and 11 says, Put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, whether there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. And so what he's saying there is through Christ, we are able to leave the old behind and take up the new. You know what, something that Jesus did in my life is I'm not the same person I used to be. Not perfect by any means. But I want to say there are new things in my life that I never had before I was a Christian. We lay down the old man with his selfishness. We put on Christ's servant's heart and we serve others around us. We lay down the old man of unforgiveness, things festering in our hearts, and we pick up the new man, and we're able to forgive because he forgave us. We lay down the old man that thinks only of himself, and we put on Jesus' eyes that looks to others around us. We lay down the old man that is critical of others, and we put on mercy and compassion towards others, giving them the benefit of the doubt. You know, baptism is the Christian symbol of dying to the old and rising in the new. The old, if you think about it, baptism, you go under the water and you rise again. The old is left below the water and you rise out of the water, the new man. Of baptism, Paul writes in Galatians 3.27, For as many of, of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so basically what he's saying there is when Jesus lives in us through faith by the power of his Spirit. In other words, when we put faith in Christ and we turn from our sins and we are born again, there's the power of God's Spirit to live in the new man. The new man was created according to Jesus. We can walk and live and be the new man, the new woman in Jesus because Jesus rose from the dead. As I said before, most of the time, empty is a bad thing. But in this case, a very good thing. Let's remember that today. You know, our church building may be empty, but you know what? So is the tomb. 
And at the end of the day, Easter is about more than a big event in our church building. It's about more than the Easter egg outreach and record attendance numbers in the service that morning. Easter is a day that the fact that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive and in him we find our life. He did it through the cross. He did it through the resurrection. And he will do it in this time that we are currently facing. I think of empty. But I want to say God is God even in spite of being empty. Let's pray as we bring this to a close. Father, we come before you today in Jesus' name. I thank you for those tuning in. I thank you that we're able to gather together in your name. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. And I pray right now, Lord, there might even be somebody who's listening to me that does not have you in their life. They're facing emptiness. You know, a lot of, I remember before I was a Christian, I there was many things I tried to fill my life with and nothing seemed to fit, you know, drugs or alcohol or relationships, all those things still left me empty. The only thing that can fill an empty heart is putting faith in Jesus and becoming a new person when your sins are washed away. And so even now as I'm praying, there might be somebody listening to me. Pray in your heart. Pray out loud right now. Say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need you. I put faith in you. I believe that you died and rose again on the third day. And I give you my life right now. Wash away my sin. Become my Lord and Savior. I give my life to you. The Bible says if you prayed that prayer, you're a new creation in Christ. And all things are in your past and you become a new person in Him. And that's a wonderful thing. And possibly even Christians hearing me today that are in you, that have you in their life right now, possibly some words from this sermon about the resurrection, the cross being empty, and there's many things that we're facing today that, you know what, we come up with empty. Maybe an empty job, maybe an empty relationship, maybe, you know what, an empty account, I want to say, but let us look to you, because with you, you know what, when we're empty, we can be full. And I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and lives and help us to rise again in your in the new nature and, and be like you because we know when we're in you, we have that new man within us. Let us put the old man down and let us rise again in the new. We thank you. We celebrate this day in honor of you. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Praise God. Have a wonderful day. Easter Sunday. We're glad that you tuned in with us. Rejoice in this day of all the things that Jesus did, the cross, the resurrection, the grave clothes. We can be like him and have a wonderful day. We'll see you Thursday. Take care. God bless. And we'll see you next time.